Ready? Ready. Lily, you ready? Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of, of Baylor. Uh, so lots of stuff in the news. Uh, first of all, uh, everyone's giving up on COVID. So the New York Times is no longer going to be reporting on uh, the data. Hopkins is already out. And soon the Texas Medical Center is also going to stop reporting. So what that means is your only source of reliable information is the CDC and me. <laughs> so we will continue because the pandemic isn't over, even though everybody's trying to pretend it is. Uh, so another thing that's come up a lot, everyone who's over the age of 50 is asking, when can I get my second booster? Because we've only been approved for one booster. And we know that immunity wanes after six um, months or so. The FDA appears to be poised, <laughs> appears to be poised to uh, approve a second booster of the, the bivalent booster soon and it is anticipated that the CDC will follow. Uh, so that is the bivalent, remember, is the original Wuhan variant and BA4-5. Uh, that is the bivalent that will be available soon. Uh, and the concern is really that only 42% of the people who are eligible have actually received the bivalent. So there's still a lot of people who need their first bivalent. But if you happen to be traveling out of the country or you're traveling soon and you don't know what to do, uh, be creative and try and get your second booster, even though it's not officially approved. Or, alternatively, uh, take with you, wherever you travel, Paxlovid and uh, a test kit, two test kits, uh, to make, just in case you get sick while you're uh, out of the country. That way you can test, and if you're tested, you can start treatment. That's what I've recommended to everybody. That's what I'm going to do. I'm leaving the country soon. I'm going to do that. Okay, uh, the other uh, thing in the news is the United Kingdom has developed, er, is trying to develop uh, an early warning system for future pandemics. And what they're going to do is randomly take individuals and swab their noses and do what we already do, which is sequence for, for bacteria and viruses uh, to try and pinpoint and anticipate uh, when there's going to be uh, a, a, new, a new organism appearing. Now, I just want to say that is exactly the wrong way to do it. You know, you cannot randomly select individuals. The right way to do it is to do large volume wastewater analysis in populations of people, sequence that, and if something crops up, you can always go back and find, you can narrow it down by narrowing which sample's positive, eventually getting to individuals. The absolute wrong way to do screening is to pick an individual randomly and, and, and do a swab. So while I applaud their effort, it's absolutely the wrong strategy. The good news is that our group uh, in the Center for Metagenomics and Microbiome Research is planning on, uh, on doing a large-scale uh, wastewater analysis. And I'll, I'll give you more updates on that, hopefully next week. So what's the CDC data right now? Uh, cases, according to the CDC, are down. They only reported uh, uh, 120,000. <laughs> only 120,000 people is a lot of people. But once again, I looked up how many prescriptions were written last week, and it was 85,000. So if you assume, and, and, and the case numbers are about half, less than half, or 50 and over, only people 50 and over are going to get prescribed uh, Paxlovid. So at least it's the double, double that number, and not everyone who got, a, got sick got Paxlovid. So I'm thinking the case number is a lot closer to 200,000 not 120,000. So that's still a lot of cases. That's, that's, that means there's a lot of virus out there. The good news is hospitalizations continue to go down. So we've talked about this. It looks like as time has gone on, the virus has become either less virulent or because people have been exposed to previous versions or been vaccinated, even partially, uh, it's provided some immunity. And so for whatever reason, I think probably a combination of the two, uh, fewer and fewer people are getting sick uh, and, and, and dying, although mortality, as we, as we talked about, mortality continues to be pretty significant. Last week, there were 1,700 deaths, and if you annualize that, that's 92,000 people dying each year, and in a very severe flu season, it'd be 50,000. So once again, while we were all pretending it's going away, it's still way worse than the worst flu season, and it's still around. Then this is the other concern. If you do look at wastewater uh, analysis by the C this is a report from the CDC, 
Thirty-two percent are reporting uh, either a doubling or a significant increase in viral burden. So red is over 100 percent, 100 to 200 percent increase. Orange is uh, 10 to 100 percent. And 32 percent of the reporting sites are reporting dramatic increases in viral uh, uh, load. And so if you look at where those are coming from, it's interesting because the Northeast, the New York City area, Connecticut, they're almost, they're all blue. That means their numbers are going down. California numbers are going down. There's a hot spot in Maine. <laughs> I have no idea what they're doing in Maine. But, you know, the hotter, the, the places where they're, they're reporting increases are in well, Western North Carolina, Ohio, Illinois, Wisconsin, some parts of Nebraska, uh, and in Colorado and Utah. So it's this band in the middle of the country that is still reporting significant increases. My guess is those are the remaining places where vaccinations were low or people didn't get infected, and that's why they're having uh, a, a recrudescence of the, of the virus. The best news of all is that XBB 1.5 remains the dominant variant. It hasn't changed in uh, several months now. That means we have a chance of you know, people getting infected becoming resistant. As long as we don't have, don't have new variants, uh, then we have a chance of uh, eventually becoming immune to what's circulating. But as I talked about last week, XBB 1.5 is almost as different as uh, the original Omicron is from the original Wuhan. So they're, equal, they're genetically diverse enough where you don't get a lot of protection from the current circulating strain if you even were infected with Omicron earlier. That's what happened to me. I got infected with Omicron and all my vaccines, and yet I got XBB. Now, it was a mild case, and that's the main thing is why you need to be up to date on your vaccinations. You, you don't want to be in the hospital, you don't want to die. If you just want to have a mild illness, that's fine. So the, there is a new variant that has been reported in, it was first identified in India, that's XBB 1.16. It's closely related to 1.5. It is a combination, it's a recombinant of the BA2 Omicron, Omicron and XBB. So a recombination event led to three new mutations that in the spike protein of XBB 1.16. And it's, it's been found, as first identified in India, it's found in many, many countries in Europe, uh, in the Far East, in uh, Thailand, also in South, uh, in Africa, uh, and China. Uh, not yet reported in, uh, in South America. Uh, but it's now in uh, 16 states in the United States, or 18 states in the United States. So it's here. The reason it's not being tracked as one of those variants on our list is because it's less than 1%. 1%. So anything that's less than 1% is not considered a variant of concern yet. My guess is it will begin to expand, it'll get over 1%, and it will become the newest variant of concern. But it's not dominating like uh, XBB 1.5 uh, did. So we'll see. We'll just have to follow it. But that's the newest variant on the horizon. So a lot of, you know, a lot of people want to say, well, okay, you know, it's over in some sense. It's more like the flu. So that, if it's like the, the standard flu season, then it doesn't require government or, you know, local intervention. It really is up to personal risk. So, you know, it's like a flu season. We all behave. We all take it on ourselves. Am I going to go to work? I'm not going to go to work. And everybody wants it, the coronavirus pandemic to be down to like a normal flu season. I already pointed out that number of cases and mortality is still way higher. But this is a really interesting study uh, that was uh, uh, done in the VA. And they wanted to look at what was the risk of death in hospitalized patients with COVID versus seasonal flu. Because early on, it was pretty you know, virulent and, and pretty dramatic. And so there were two studies that were published in 2020 that showed that COVID-19 had a five-fold uh, risk for mortality, 30-day mortality in the hospital when compared to influenza. And what we've seen is it's gotten, you know, less virulent over time. And so this study was looking at uh, the database from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. There were 9,000 hospitalizations for COVID and 2,400 hospitalizations for seasonal flu. And early on in 2020, the death rate of 30-day mortality for people hospitalized with uh, COVID, veterans hospitalized with COVID-19, was around 20% versus influenza, which was around 3.8 or 4%. So big, you know, five-fold difference, 20% versus 4%.
So they wanted to look at how is it doing now. Well, the, no, the, the, the mortality has really decreased uh, uh, pretty dramatically, and it's down to about 6% with COVID and still remains around 4% with flu. So what that means is we're getting closer and closer to the, the morbidity and mortality of a flu, but it's still higher. You know, as I pointed out, deaths are still almost twice. This data is 1.5-fold increase. Uh, the other interesting thing from this study was the risk of mortality was much higher in unvaccinated individuals. And so the conclusion from this is first, get your vaccines, please. But secondly, we're not quite down to what uh, coronavirus isn't quite down to what a flu season is like. It still remains more significant in a lot more cases. So interesting study uh, came out of uh, Biomed Central uh, Infectious Disease looking at what are the determinants of people who are getting vaccinated, because we still are under-vaccinated in the country. This was a, a survey uh, looking at people who, why they did or did not get vaccinated. And the issue is, you know, 31% of the United States population has not really completed their primary series of vaccination. So this was an online survey of 3,000 participants. And what determined when they were more likely to get vaccinated was if they knew somebody who got seriously ill from COVID. And then the, on the other side, what was the major determinant of them not getting vaccinated was they had a, a friend or a, a person they knew had a complication of the vaccination. What, what I'm impressed with that's not in there is the advice of their doctor or you know, any kind of data. It was really sort of personal uh, experience. And the problem is, you know, how many times have you heard somebody say, well, I got vaccinated, my arm hurt, or I felt terrible, <laughs> it gave me this or that, which is probably not true or not significant, but that's enough to dissuade people from getting vaccinated. So every time you get vaccinated, you go like, oh my God, I feel miserable. You're having an influence on people. So stop complaining about it. That's the main thing. Uh, so I was really surprised that, you know, physician, physician uh, recommendation was nowhere near in that, unfortunately. Okay, and then one really uh, interesting paper that came out in uh, Nature uh, Microbiology, we've been talking about the problem with the vaccinations, the mRNA vaccines, is that they induce this very good uh, IgG response, circulating immune, uh, immune uh, uh, antibodies, but not a very good mucosal response. And so we've been waiting for, uh, you know, some sort of newer uh, strategy. So this was a study uh, that where some investigators compared uh, in hamsters, in Syrian hamsters, uh, mRNA vaccine, Pfizer vaccine, the adenovirus spike uh, uh, vaccine, which is AstraZeneca's, which we know wasn't that effective, but it's a different type of virus, uh, different type of vaccine. Those were in administered intramuscularly to hamsters, and then a live attenuated SARS-CoV-2 virus administered in the nose. So you go like, well, a live attenuated, that's kind of scary. Well. That the flu mist is actually a cold adapted, in other words, an attenuated live flu virus. It's adapted to only replicate in cold at the nose, and that's exactly the kind of strategy. You know, putting a, a replicating but uh, not a, 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 uh, uh, an attenuated virus that doesn't cause illness that will might that might stimulate nasal uh, uh, immune responses. And it turns out uh, it did. It was very effective. Uh, and superior in terms of, uh, of generating an antibody response, particularly a mucosal immune response. So that is really an exciting uh, finding. Uh, obviously, that's preclinical. It's in hamsters. We don't know if it's going to be in people. But that gives us a lot of hope that maybe we'll get something like flu mist type virus, uh, an attenuated virus that can be given uh, intranasally and induce a much better mucosal immune response. So that was an interesting uh, paper. So I want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, today is the 20th anniversary of the completion of the sequencing of the human genome. Giant event in, in history, one of the great scientific accomplishments. Baylor College of Medicine is one of the original uh, contributing uh, 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 centers to sequence the human genome. We're going to have a big symposium and celebration in a few weeks to celebrate that event. I also want to welcome uh, our new chair of orthopedic surgery, Doug Derschel. Uh, he joins us from the University of Chicago, nationally renowned orthopedic surgeon whose uh, area of expertise is in uh, trauma and in, uh, bone infections and also fragility fractures. We're very excited to have him joining us. Also, it's alumni reunion. We're really excited about this because this is our first 
person reunion since 2019. So we're going to actually all get together. It'd be great to have our graduates on, on campus again. I think we have well over 120 or 130 uh, folks coming back. And of course, the most important thing is that Lily is back. She's back from the spa. She spent two weeks in North Carolina. She was desperate to come home, and we're happy to see her. Uh, and we have some, I think we have some video of her experiences uh, back in North Carolina. Anyway, uh, have a great weekend, and I can't wait to see you next week.